Because I am a pastor, I read a lot of books on management. Did you think I was going to say theology? A lot of books on management. And that's because when you think about the job of pastor, it's not just spiritual. I mean, between our two parishes, we have about 15 staff members, some of them full-time, some of them part-time, some of them unpaid, but there they are. And managing them takes a lot of attention. If you put the two budgets of the two churches together, it's almost a million dollars. So pastors who want to be good at their job have to read books and study up on how to be good managers. And I know there's a lot of people here who work in management, so you probably have heard exactly what these management books say. They say this, everyone has strengths and weaknesses. Don't waste your time on people's weaknesses. If somebody's not good at something, it's going to take a lot to get them good at it. So let it go. If they're a good employee, put them in what they're good at. If you want to invest in them and they're not good at math, don't send them to classes for math. Waste your time and money doing that. They're not good at math. Put them in a role where they don't have to use math. And then you'll be happy and they'll be happy. And that makes sense for management. But it's not good for spiritual growth. We're not here to get some product out, to get some job done, to get some kind of outcome like you would in a business. We are here to thrive. We're here to reach our potential. God is not interested in the outcome. God is interested in each of us. So if we look at what all the greats of history have done, the people like the Abraham Lincolns and the Gandhis and the Francis of Assisi's, they have all been willing to look at their weaknesses. And they don't just look at them, they are willing to confront them. Confront means to face something. They face their weaknesses and they wrestle with them and they fight them. And in that wrestling, they became great. And that is what we are called to do. We are called to use this time to figure out what is your, what is my signature sin? What is the weakness, the problem, the defect in us that needs to be confronted, needs to be faced? because it is getting in the way. And in confronting it, we will deepen our character and become more of who we're meant to be. I could understand if someone walking into church today would say, oh, brother, this is heavy. I mean, life is hard, so I come here to get some inspiration. I need a, I need a hopeful message. I don't want to get down on myself. I already deal with that all day, every day. But I'd like to present to you that the energy of Lent is not negative. It is not negative energy. It is transformative energy. The work that we do in Lent is not used to get down on ourselves. It is what we use to propel ourselves forward, to go from being good enough to really great. And this is not meant to be an endless time. We're going to spend 40 days on this. Out of 365 days, we're going to spend 40. And then, because we'll work hard over these next 40 days, the church is going to give us 50 days to rejoice and feast. So this isn't a negative time. It's a transformative time. And so if we're ready to transform, I would encourage you to take a look at that list that we passed out to you when you walked into church. This list has been given to us by the 12 steps. This is a list of about 20 key character defects that people have in their lives. And if you look at this list, you will see perhaps a few things that you know you need to work on. 
All of us deal with some of this stuff. Maybe all of us deal a little bit with all of it. But one or two of those is key for you. And they're maybe the same as the ones that are key for me. They may be different. But these are the things that we need to look at. And the question that we get to ask ourselves now is, what does God want me to use this Lent to wrestle with? Which of these is the signature thing that I really need to spend time with? The people who look at this list are people dealing with addiction to alcohol or drugs or food or whatever else. And so they know that they're in a battle for their lives. So they wrestle with each of these things to figure out, what do I need to do to survive this? And, and when we're looking at this list, we may be thinking of individual moments in our life, but that's not what this is about. We're not gonna spend Lent looking back at individual moments, not incidents. We are actually looking for the defect that causes the incidents. We bring the incidents to confession, but this 40 days is to look at what's beneath it. So here's the challenge for you for Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. I would love to challenge you to be able by the end of today to identify which of those things is going to be the one that God and you together choose for this Lent. So that if I saw you at Silver Spoon and I said, hey, what'd you choose? You'd have it. Oh, I don't know, Father. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll get back to you. Can I leave a message at the office? Well, no, there's only 40 days. We have to start now. So I'd love for you to be able to name it to yourself. If someone else is here with you right now or if someone's going to be here later, I'd love for you to be able to say, which one did you choose and have a conversation about it? And then, if you haven't already, pick a Lenten discipline that will go with that. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, I give up ice cream every Lent. And that's a great thing to do. Self-restraint is great. But if your key sin is not gluttony, then that's really not that helpful to you, right? A lot of us maybe say, oh, I'll give up ice cream and maybe I'll lose a few pounds. But that's not really your issue. So giving up ice cream is not helpful. If your issue, for example, is impatience, ice cream has nothing to do with that. Maybe if your issue is impatience, a good Lenten practice would be for the next 40 days to always choose the longest line at whatever business you're in so that you have to confront impatience. When you're at the grocery store or the bank or the drugstore, you don't choose the short line, you choose the long line for a spiritual purpose so that you have to face your impatience. So some people have said to me, you know, Father, you talk a lot about addiction in your homilies. Why is that? And it's because if you or someone you love is somebody who's dealt with addiction or is dealing with it now, that is the highest spiritual work that can be done in this life. It is a fight for someone's life. And so they are the experts in helping us to see how someone goes from a challenging, miserable, difficult life, because after all, addiction is a fatal illness if untreated to living their best life. So this list of character defects is given to us by the experts in struggle, the experts in confronting, the experts in wrestling. Some of us might say, well, I'm not an addict. Why am I having to face this? Well, the definition of addiction is when there's something in your life that you can't help but do. You can't go a day without doing it. And if you're human, you can't go a day without sinning. Not one day. We're addicted to sinning. We are, by definition. That's addiction. So, if we were here to impress our manager, we would let go of our weaknesses, ignore the defects, and build on our strengths. But there's no manager here. It's just us and God. And God loves us exactly as we are right now. And God loves us too much to let us stay like that.